Hello, everybody. We're going to talk today about inequality. And most of us could draw a map of the city where we live, about the areas that are prosperous and less so. Different neighborhoods have different names that we sort of know as codes for where those places are. We, today, we want to talk about Richmond, Virginia, where we're located. Uh, and to see the patterns there that you can often see in other ways in cities across the United States. Now, it's easy to imagine that these patterns of inequality are somehow natural, maybe inevitable, but like all inequalities and injustices, they have a history. What we wanna to do today is look at a deeper history than we sometimes perceive to see how we got here today. So we hear about the phrase systemic racism, but we don't always hear about how it came to be systemic, how the system was built, how it was maintained, how it was reinvented several times. Now we could begin our story of Richmond in the 17th century with English colonization, the dispossession of native peoples and the first evolution of African slavery. Or we could begin with the 18th century with the vast importations of enslaved people from Africa and the rapid growth of the native born enslaved population until African-American people accounted for 40% of the colonist population. But Richmond was a late arrival to these stories, established when enslavement had been a fundamental fact of Virginia for over a century. Richmond became a city in 1782 and became the capital of Virginia in 1785. Now, there was never a Richmond without slavery. The young city and slavery evolved together, each shaping the other, giving slavery a unique form in Richmond. Here, more enslaved people worked in factories than in anywhere else in the slave South, often alongside free Black people, often hired out by their owners so they could determine where they live and could perhaps save enough money through extra work to buy the freedom of themselves or their families, though that was really hard. But slavery was not lax in Richmond, even if it was complicated. Restrictions on enslaved people became ever harsher over time as authorities sought to contain black literacy, religious autonomy, and gatherings. So we want to look now at a series of visualizations made by the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. My colleagues there, Robert Nelson, Justin Madrin, and Nathaniel Ayers, have made a series of remarkable projects that help us see the patterns of inequality in ways we just can't see otherwise. They've won major prizes and international attention for the work which has been viewed by millions of people. You may explore these for yourself at dsl.richmond.edu when we're finished, but first let me show you the full array before you go off on your own. My colleague at New American History, Annie Evans, will help us navigate through these projects. Let's begin with an animation of Richmond in 1853 where we can see how the slave trade fit into the city. The areas there that we will see in places that are red, or not only in the ragged houses and shops down along the railroad tracks and the river, but also nearby, near the capital that you can see there, or the capital grounds, the finest hotels where wealthy purchasers could examine potential property in private. The slave trading business made millions of dollars buying, grading, feeding, clothing, insuring, financing, and marketing over 300,000 people. Bought, sold, and traded here, separated from their children, their parents, and other loved ones. Hundreds of thousands of people were shipped by rail and steamboat across the South to New Orleans, to Mississippi, and to Texas. It's impossible to imagine the suffering and despair of that domestic slave trade, but this is what Richmond will commemorate along the railroad tracks you see there on the, in the map in Shaco Bottom, where after decades of work by many dedicated people, we will have a memorial. This was all part of a vast network of slavery and of the slave trade, as we'll see in the next map, which shows us the evolution of black population change between 1830 and 1840. What we see there is that areas that are blue are places where the population was declining, which means in this case, where people were being sold. You see Virginia is the brightest of blue, along south, Southern Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, parts of Georgia, Kentucky. The areas that are copper, areas where the population was growing, is where enslaved people were being taken in the 1830s, what became the Black Belt of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, the Mississippi River from Memphis all the way to New Orleans. So Richmond was a hub in this vast system of the domestic slave trade. In the trade, more than a million people were shipped across state lines. More than two million people were entangled in movements within states. 
for many of them, a separation of 100 miles might as well have been one of 1,000 miles. They would never see their loved ones again. The results of that trade is evident throughout Virginia. What we can see is that Eastern Virginia became a place from which people were basically gathered, taken to Richmond, and shipped across the South. In the next map, we can see the effects of relentless family separation, which shows that the way that the sugar plantations of Louisiana and the new cotton fields of Mississippi and Texas concentrated young black men, the areas that are orange and uh, brown. Areas that are various shades of green is where young black women predominated. What this shows is that most of the slave owning households of the South were able only to purchase one or two enslaved people. And when they did, the majority purchased women who could not only take care of the house and working fields, but also bore children that would be the property of slaveholders. You see that Virginia is surprised in this regard. There's no real reason for so many men disproportionately to live here, except perhaps that so many young women had been sold away. This vast and profitable system of slavery was never more profitable than in 1860, when the Confederacy gambled everything on creating its own nation based on slavery and lost it all. Slavery ended here more abruptly, violently, and completely than in any other slave society of the hemisphere. And Richmond was at the center of it all. The next map shows where enslaved people came into contact with the United States Army across the war. Just as American slavery began in Virginia, so did it begin to end in 1861. What we see here is that the areas where the United States Army was present, the places where black people went to the US Army to try to claim a degree of freedom, all across Virginia, up and down the coast near South Carolina, up and down the Mississippi and Tennessee rivers. Again, Virginia has a unique position because Fort Monroe on the coast of uh, Virginia, as the next map shows, became an early refuge for people almost immediately after Virginia seceded. Three black men went to the United States Army and said, we want to be on your side, the side of freedom. Within two, three years, 10,000 African-American people had gone to Hampton near Fort Monroe. Now after emancipation, black Richmonders, black Southerners struggled to find a place for themselves. And as before the wars, the next map shows, Black people left Virginia in large numbers. You see the blue is continuing in freedom, just as it did under slavery. But you'll also notice the areas that have been red, places where the United States Army disrupted slavery, gave enslaved people a refuge, saw large numbers of black people leave, South Carolina and Mississippi in particular. The fact was that rural Virginia simply had less to offer than places in the deep south and certainly in the cities that you can see growing there, Nashville, Memphis, New Orleans, Charleston, Richmond, Norfolk, all those are places where the black population concentrated to try to build new lives for themselves. Now, it was at this time that Richmond became segregated in a new way. Before emancipation, black people lived among white people as domestics who took care of their children and homes. While there were some parts of town where black people concentrated, always the lowest wedded, wettest and least healthy places, white people kept them near at hand. But after emancipation, black and white people increasingly separated, both by choice and by force. This is when Jackson Ward was created, the product of both black people gathering to create businesses and found churches, establish cemeteries and start banks and newspapers, but also of white gerrymandering, where they tried to concentrate the black population so it would have less political power. Black men voted in the decades after Reconstruction at both the city and the state level until the 1901-1902 Constitutional Convention wrote laws that basically eviscerated black voting for the next seven decades. In the meantime, the city, as this next uh, slide shows, became segregated. In Jackson Ward and other places on, in Richmond, uh, black people created their own cemeteries. This is the East End Cemetery that you can search and you can find the names of the people interred there. But these were also the decades when statues were erected on Monument Avenue and when restricted covenants were written for neighborhoods, including new neighborhoods stretching down from Cary Street and Grove Avenue toward West Hampton. Here you see ads uh, that were bragging 
on the fact, as the lower right-hand corner shows, restrictions that no Negroes, people of African descent, will ever be able to live in those neighborhoods. Now, at the same time, Black people continue to leave Virginia, now increasingly for the cities of the Northeast. When the Great Migration began during World War I and continued in the 1920s and 30s, it built upon generations of Black migration from Virginia. You'll see that now a lot of the areas to which Black people had moved in the Black Belt along the Mississippi Delta became places from which people lived. You can also see that Black people move, continued to move to cities in the South. And you can see that Virginia has basically continued slow decline of population. So Richmond is becoming segregated at the same time that Black people are leaving Virginia to go to Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, basically anywhere where there were better paying jobs than there were in Richmond. Now faced with the Great Depression that began in the 1930s, the federal government tried to stimulate wealth building through what it called the Home Owners Loan Corporation, the HOLC or HOLC, which operated between 1935 and 1940. The, the maps made by Hulk have been mapped by the Digital Scholarship Lab. We're gonna look at the one for Richmond, but they have this for over 200 cities. The idea was that they would ease mortgage lending by reducing the risks of those who would extend money by defining what they call the best neighborhoods. And it's just showing you there that neighborhoods that are green are considered the best, the lowest risk. You'll recognize that they are in the West. Neighborhoods that were considered not quite as good, still desirable to call, are on the North side, farther West uh, and to the South side. These would be places that they would have places that were considered still desirable, but that would not be uh, the, the richest population. The next area would be areas that were definitely declining and the yellow, and you can see those were uh, areas that today the fan, but also the north side area, some of the east. Uh, and so those areas would be uh, turning over to renters. And then there are the red areas that are considered hazardous, by which they meant that they were uh, dominated by African-American people. And you can see where those are located. Many of the areas that were where we saw the slave trade was located in the lowest parts of the city down on the railroad tracks. The idea behind all of this is, is that where you had uh, different groups living together, it was what they called inharmonious, that it created, that lowered property values, that they assumed that white people wanted to live only among other white people. And in other cities in the United States, some inharmonious groups were considered to be Asian or Jewish or Italian or Polish or Greek or Mexican or Russian. In Richmond and other cities of the South, they were African American. So you see what happens here. In the name of increasing home ownership, the primary form of intergenerational wealth building was systematically denied to others in a collaboration between the government and private businesses. What this means is that in these crucial decades, when the primary form of gathering wealth was to own a home and improve it, that was systematically denied to black people. So what we can see is the areas that were, uh, will return to these neighborhoods, kind of keep in mind what these look like. Um, and what we'll see is that this changes radically with another change that came uh, to the city. This is an, a, an ever called renewing inequality, a map renewing inequality, which is all about urban renewal. The idea of urban renewal is that, first of all, you would put interstate highways uh, through the middle of the city. If you've ever been to Richmond, you know I-95 and I-64 run through the city, and he's tracing that for us there. And what you'll see is that they went through the very same areas that are marked here that are the, the poorest areas, uh, and they basically demolished homes. What this means is they also demolished neighborhoods. They put interstate highways between people in their churches or the newspapers or their businesses. So ironically, in the name of improving their cities and of getting rid of poverty, what they did was concentrate poverty uh, in housing projects. Uh, and you see here Carver, uh, and when you click on it, you'll see it's 99% African-American. You go over to the 17th Street neighborhood, you see there's the same pattern. So what you're seeing here is the patterns that we began seeing, that right there where Annie's clicked now, is exactly in Shaco Bottom 
uh, and where the domestic slave trade was located. You can see when Annie clicks on poverty and, on, uh, poverty and race uh, and then clicks on where the redlining, you can see right next to that, you can see the neighborhoods are exactly the same so-called red neighborhoods that were there before. So this begins the Richmond that we know today, which is defined so much by I-95 running through the center of it. Now this so-called urban renewal, which black opponents called sarcastically Negro removal, uh, had another effect. Those same interstate highways carried white residents away into new suburbs surround, spreading to the south and the west, hollowing out city neighborhoods, reducing the tax base, separating people into ever finer gradations of class, race, ethnicity, and politics. And we still live with those changes, but they're starting to take new forms. The last project we're gonna look at is called Not Even Past. And what it does is directly connects the redlining maps that we saw from the 1930s with new indices of, of inequality called the SVI, Social Vulnerability Index. And what those do is to, the, the SVI combines housing and transportation factors, minority status and language, household composition, disability, to give us an overall metric. And Annie is showing you the, there you can see those lines that are connecting um, the red lining to areas of today. We see that the social vulnerability in the early 2000s is very much like the social vulnerability of the 1930s. So what, one thing that you can see, there's been a great bifurcation from the 1930s to current census tracts. Areas Annie's shown you there that were uh, generally green have stayed green. Areas that were red down at the bottom have generally stayed red. Uh, but a few areas in between uh, that were sort of in the middle in yellow, some of them in the fan have become more exclusive, while other areas that were yellow before, as you can see, uh, have become uh, more bifurcated. So what this means is, is that uh, areas today that are uh, more finely graded, and you will see some areas in the south side that Annie's showing here, uh, are there. Look at that area right there. You can see how there on the north side, some neighborhoods are doing quite well, but others have, have the social vulnerability index has increased. You'll see in Churchill, other places that find gradations, that there'll be some streets that are doing quite well, others that are uh, not doing nearly as well as all. So what we see generally, however, areas that were favored in the 1930s are favored today. We're in fact more geographically divided than we were 90 years ago as the city bifurcates into ever more prosperous areas and ever more desperate areas. And if this map's extended into the counties, we can see poverty spreading in Chesterfield and Henrico. We can see that people of Latin American ancestry are experiencing the deprivations of housing, services, and education that Black people have long endured. Now, recent maps in New York Times build on the maps that Rob, Justin, and Nate have made to show that climate change affects Richmond neighborhoods Redline back in the 1930s in debilitating ways. Here, areas that are blue are areas that are most vulnerable to climate change, while areas that are green shades of, of brown uh, are, uh, have a lot of trees. And you can see that areas that were favored in the past are areas that are favored still today. Another recent report shows that COVID concentrates in the same neighborhoods that were disadvantaged back in the 1930s. So perhaps as we watch history unfold over two centuries, as we did today, can help us understand where we stand today and where we need to go. We're gonna need leadership from all different directions, from government and finance industry and civic groups and educational groups. We're gonna need young people to understand how things came to be this way. Because what we wanna know as we cast our mind back to the legacies of the 1820s and then the 1920s, we can determine that we will do better in the 2020s. Thanks very much, everybody.